Excellency, dear friends, a warm welcome to the UN Global Compact SDG Business Forum, part of the UNGC live events this UN General Assembly week. My name is Eric Ashkin, and I will be your moderator today. In this session, we will talk about the upcoming UN conference co-hosted by Portugal and Kenya, taking place in Lisbon next year. And we will discuss the role of the ocean and the 2030 agenda. Although the UN Ocean Conference was postponed because of the pandemic, the level of engagement and commitment to healthy and productive ocean has not decreased. Instead, we are undoubtedly seeing a number of partnerships, initiatives, coalitions forming to deliver, deliver on ocean action, while new science-based innovative solutions accelerate with rapid pace. This will be the key for the UN Ocean Conference and to deliver on its core theme, scaling up ocean action based on science and innovation for the implementation of Goal 14, stock taking, partnerships and solutions. At the UN Global Compact, we encourage all stakeholders to continue submitting their commitments to the UN, Global, UN Ocean Conference website. The conference will be the perfect place to show that you are taking action now. With that said, it is my honor to give the floor to the first of our long list of excellent speakers, Ms. Maria Francesca Spatulisano, Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs at the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to open this breakout session, which is part of the 2020 edition of the SDG Business Forum, as Eric just said. On behalf of the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, I want to thank our partners from the United Nations Global Compact and the International Chamber of Commerce for creating and expanding the space for dialogue on the contribution of the private sector to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Today's breakout session is very timely. Although the United Nations Ocean Conference has been postponed, as we know, due to COVID-19, the preparatory process continues under the leadership of the co-hosts, Kenya and Portugal, and counting on the energy and action-oriented mobilization of the United Nations Secretary General, the Special Envoy for Ocean, Ambassador Peter Thompson, who we are honored to have with us today. With the aim of keeping the momentum towards ocean action, UNDESA, through its Division for Sustainable Development Goals, has been promoting a series of activities, including online consultations and open webinars, to bring in the perspectives from stakeholders from different sectors, including the private sector, in preparation for the Ocean Conference. The health of the ocean is intimately tied to our health. Despite the many pressing emergencies, ocean conservation and action should not come to a halt while we tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to look at long-term solutions for the health of our planet as a whole. Moreover, the ocean can be an ally against COVID-19. UNESCO has noted that bacteria found in the depths of the ocean are used to carry out rapid testing to detect the presence of COVID-19. And the diversity of species found in the ocean offers great promises for pharmaceuticals. So we must tap into this potential, but with responsibility. The fight against the pandemic also offers an opportunity to revive the ocean and start building a sustainable ocean economy. As an example, a report by the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific suggests that the temporary shutdown of activities as well as reduced mobility, human mobility and resource uh, demands due to COVID pandemic may provide marine environments the much needed breathing space for them to start to recover. We must restart on a blue sustainable path. Today's event is a unique opportunity to hear from the private sector leaders 
on how to further mobilize the sector towards SDG 14 implementation and hear and gather ideas and recommendations to keep the momentum for ocean action and the UN Ocean Conference next year. Let us be reminded of the theme of this conference, uh, scaling up ocean action based on science and innovation for the implementation of goal 14, stop taking partnerships and solutions. Despite the many challenges imposed by COVID-19, now more than ever, we need to be creative in connecting the stakeholders and initiating solutions to recover better together in order to accelerate SDG implementation in the decade of action. Ocean action rooted in science and innovation driven by the private sector will be vital in this regard. I wish you all a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. That was a mute. Uh, somebody's double muting you. So thank you so much, Maria. Now, what is the outlook for the ocean and the SDGs? Please welcome Special Advisor on Ocean, UN Global Compact, Mr. Sturla Henriksen. Please, the floor is yours. So, thank you, Eric. Excellencies, dear friends, a very good morning, afternoon and evening to you all. I hope you are well and safe in these challenging times. Times are indeed challenging, as we are entering the decade of deliveries on the Sustainable Development Goals. The COVID-19 pandemic is profoundly impacting every aspect of human life and every corner of society. And to deal with these challenges and to build back better, we need responsible and wise leadership in all walks of life and at all levels of society. We need leadership with these old-fashioned traits like integrity, competence, respect, tolerance, and decency. We need leaders inspiring hope and guiding direction. Leaders who have the qualities to step up to the challenges and opportunities. Leaders who have the courage to tear down walls and the wisdom to build bridges across national, political, and ethnical boundaries. We need leaders in politics, business, and society at large, we understand that if we are to ensure peace, prosperity, and in a world expected to grow by 2 billion people over the next few decades, we need more international cooperation, more common solutions, and more mutual trust. We need leaders in the business community to come forward and fully mobilize the insights, the energy, and resources of the business sector, aligning their commercial practices, operation, and strategies with the declared ambitions of the 17 SDGs. And for that, we need common rules and references for fair and level playing fields, regulatory standards, and market environments, rewarding companies contributing to the right side of history, and sanctioning those who don't. And we need to understand embrace and utilize the fact that we are living on the blue planet. Without the ocean, we cannot survive. Without it, we cannot achieve the future that we want. When the UN Global Compact Action Platform was established two and a half years ago, the ocean was still an obscure and mostly forgotten topic at the fringes of public and political attention. Basically, those who for many years cared or pioneered the issue we mainly concerned about the pressing and important challenges of preservation and conservation as stated in SDG 14, life below water. <clears throat> Since then, the ocean has surged on the political agenda. There is a growing recognition that we cannot succeed in achieving the 17 SDGs on a broad scale without producing more food, energy, medicines, minerals, and transportation from the ocean. For the future that we want, we need to improve ocean health while concurrently tapping the ocean's wealth. And to this end, we have defined the nine principles 
for sustainable ocean business, which have so far been endorsed and signed by companies with a market cap in excess of two trillion US dollars. We have made an extensive mapping of ocean governance and regulation, the first of its kind, as an initial step to identify gaps, overlaps, and inconsistencies. Not too much Global Goals, Ocean Opportunities, and the Ocean Stewardship Report 2030, we are offering a holistic, comprehensive approach to how the ocean can contribute to better lives for more people. And even more importantly, these reports are both pointing to specific actions urgently needed to succeed in this decade of deliveries by mobilizing the collective wisdom and insights of our esteemed partners from business, research, and regulatory institutions, we have defined the five tipping points for a healthy and productive ocean. Decarbonizing shipping, ensuring sustainable seafood production, generating electricity, ending waste, entering the ocean, and last but not least, mapping the ocean, expanding a knowledge of the deep blue. As for the latter, we have signed an agreement with the UNESCO IOC to cooperate through this decade of ocean science. Representatives from major banks, insurance companies, and institutional investors have been an integral part of our ocean action platform from the very beginning. Finance is a key enabler and common denominator for industrial activities. Without significant investments, there will be no sustainable improvements. And therefore, we're just about to release a set of blue bond principles serving as references for commercial investments and financing of sustainable businesses. Also, employing the collective insights and capacity of our ocean action platform, members, we have launched a set of work streams related to the urgent challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic on how we can extract medicines from the rich resources of marine genomes how we can build better resilience into the seafood production cycle, how we can improve ocean data collection and dissemination, and how we can address the urgent matter of crew change, a humanitarian safety and economic challenge threatening people's lives and risking to disrupt the vitally important ocean supply chains. As for the latter, we are co-hosting a high-level conference this Thursday on the World Maritime Day together with ILO and IMO, and with participation from the heads of ICS and ITF, maritime ministers from key nations, and executives from large multinationals. I believe these are all important achievements and deliveries, but it's not until now that we are facing the real test, how to translate reports and ambitions, principles and plans into tangible, transformative actions, as we are now entering the decade of deliveries on the SDGs. Let me conclude by commending our cooperation and partnership with the other UN agencies and with you, Peter. Let's make this event and the upcoming UN conference on the ocean testimonies to the good spirit of mutual trust and close cooperation that the world so urgently needs in these challenging times and in the defining years and decades ahead. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Back to you, Eric. Thank you so much, Stula, and uh, thank you so much for those perspectives. Uh, so, uh, let me just see my script there. So, uh, let's now see how we all can come together and make sure to increase the momentum towards the UN Ocean Conference. To give us a clear call to action, please welcome the very own UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean, Mr. Peter Thompson. Thank you very much, Eric, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. All courtesies observed, and wherever you are, I hope that you and your families are safe and well during these trying times. My thanks to UN Global Compact and UN DESA for organizing today's event and for giving me the opportunity of speaking to you today. Uh, it's wonderful to see your old friends on the panel, and I, I think that this is the first time that uh, Donna Bertarelli and I have been in uh, on the same panel after her appointment as the UNCTAD Special Advisor on the Blue Economy. So welcome Donna to the uh, Wolfpack and uh, we will get SDG 14 implemented with the help of people such as yourself. 
But great to see our friends there on the panel. Uh, thanks also to the authors of the Ocean Stewardship 2030 report. It's a very useful roadmap for how ocean-related industries and policymakers can jointly secure a healthy and productive ocean by 2030. We need such good guidance if we're to successfully achieve SDG 14's goals by 2030, uh, which, as you know, are conserving and sustainably using the ocean's resources. So I urge you to read the report. Ladies and gentlemen, if we're to have a future in which we live in harmony with what remains of the natural world, we've arrived at the beginning of the decade during which we're required to transform our patterns of consumption, production, and habitat destruction, or suffer the bitter consequences. There is so much we must end, so much we've got to put behind us, such as halting the plague of plastic pollution that we've put upon the ocean, or ceasing the multi-billions of dollars worth of subsidies for industrial, industrial fishing fleets that go out hunting diminishing stocks of fish. Remember that over 34% of global fish stocks over, are overfished. These things are very doable, stopping plastic pollution and ending overfishing. We've got to just do them, and we've got a decade in which to make that happen. And we have to stop the alteration of the temperature and chemical composition of the ocean that has been caused by our anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions before it's too late. You've probably already heard my mantra, no healthy planet without a healthy ocean. And I don't have time this morning to talk uh, that through with you, but the logical conclusion is that for our collective well-being, we must face up to the reality of our times and make the required transformations of our production and consumption patterns. And a, very, a, a virtuous trifecta, and this is where business comes in, a virtuous trifecta of consumers and companies and governments can make that happen. I'd like to say some words on the blue-green recovery that we must surely take in the wake of the pandemic that we're living through. And I'd like to make the point that a sustainable blue economy is one of the most reliable stepping stones along that road that is opening up ahead. By way of example, I commend you to one of the recent reports issued by the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy, available on the internet, entitled A Sustainable Ocean Economy for 2050, Approximating Its Benefits and Costs. The report provides very positive, including the fact that after expert economic analysis, sustainable ocean-based investments yield returns at least five times greater than their costs. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the sustainable blue economy upon which human security will so heavily lean on in coming times. To arrive at that conclusion, the report's authors examined four ocean-based policy in interventions, conserving and restoring mangrove habitats, scaling up offshore wind renewable energy, decarbonizing international shipping, and increasing the production of sustainably sourced ocean-based proteins to ensure healthy, balanced human diets by 2050. The report's analysis demonstrates that over a period of 30 years, investing between 2 and $3.7 trillion globally across these four areas would generate a net benefit of between 8 and $22.8 .8 trillion. Obviously, a wider awareness of these handsome returns and investment will strengthen the economic imperative for action and support our overall quest for a healthy ocean. So please read the report and spread the word. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude my remarks, I'll say something now about the ocean, UN Ocean Conference. And as you know, the UN has mandated the holding of the next UN Ocean Conference to be held in Lisbon and to be co-hosted by the governments of Kenya and Portugal. Because of the pandemic, the conference has been postponed until 2021 with confirmed dates to be announced once the course of the pandemic is clearer. In the meantime, step-by-step -step preparations for the conference are proceeding, and there are many things about it which are already certain. The first is that fisheries will be a major element of consideration. This is so because Sustainable Development Goal 14 contains four crucial targets that mature in 2020, two of which directly address rationalizing our management of the ocean's fisheries resources. If, for example, all countries stay true to the universally agreed SDG 14.6 relating to the ending of harmful fisheries subsidies, this target is eminently achievable at the WTO General Council meeting in December 
So as I say, uh, work is underway to make that conference a success. Another element that is certain for Lisbon is that science and innovation and solutions and partnerships will be infused into the work of the conference. This is guaranteed, as the UN member states in their wisdom decided as such in designating the conference theme. A third element that is, uh, that is uh, a fact that is going to happen is that the co-hosts, Portugal and Kenya, are determined to oversee a conference that will emulate its 2017 predecessor by being a global game changer for the better for ocean action, all in support of SDG 14's successful implementation. You know, in all three of these, uh, these three steps, there's a critical role to be played by business. Thus, I encourage you all to prepare for Lisbon in a positive, partnering, solutions-oriented spirit. And I look forward to being a part of that journey with you whenever or whenever you might choose to call on my assistance. I close with these words. The way I see it, everything we're doing, be it in biodiversity or be it in our ocean work, all roads lead to the Glasgow Climate Cop in November next year. Glasgow must be the watershed for the decade that is coming. At that watershed, we'll decide whether we're gonna continue on our current road to the ecological destruction of four degrees centigrade global warming by the end of this century, or whether we're going to agree to undertake the required transformations of our consumption and production patterns that I pointed to in the opening of my remarks to you today. It is everyone's responsibility, individuals, companies, corporations, governments, to decide on which side of that watershed we wish to be and take the necessary actions now to make that so. And I thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to sticking around and hearing my friends on the panel uh, and what they have to say to us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Always very inspiring to listen to you, of course, but uh, you are nailing it. Uh, we can do it. We can do it now. So get your commitments together, uh, submit them on the website, and also sign up for the conference when we know we have the exact date. It will be very important uh, for next year. It's a super year coming up, or should have been a super year today, but the COP26 will be at a major milestone at the end of next year. So what is really the potential of the blue economy looking forward? As Peter said, there is a lot of opportunities for business here. So please welcome actually the fastest woman, woman to sail around the world, and been told, Ms. Donna Battarelli, Special Advisor for the Blue Economy on the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Please. Thank you. I'm delighted to join you today. A sustainable blue economy can support not just SDG 14, but also the global goals on poverty, hunger, jobs, gender equality, partnerships, resilient communities, and climate change. It drives economic growth and development while supporting livelihoods and the health of the ocean. I like to compare the challenges facing coastal and island communities with those I face as a skipper. One must balance the need for results with the need to manage limited resources, keep your crew safe and your boat undamaged if you want to get home safely. To succeed in the ocean economy, it is the same. One must balance production and protection while providing long-term benefits to the community. Through my work supporting the creation of marine protected areas, I've seen how reliant developing countries are on the ocean for food, transport, tourism, and the flow of goods. This is especially true for small island developing states, or seeds, which are critically impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Tourism supports over 60% of some island economies. So when tourism is disrupted, there is nothing left. On top of this, seeds are heavily dependent on imported goods. Barbados, for example, imports 90% of its food. So learning from this crisis, economies should diversify. There's a growing interest from financial institutions and private businesses to invest in the innovation and technology needed to develop a healthy ocean economy. Add this to economic stimulus packages for post-COVID-19 recovery, and it is clear that we can make a resilient ocean economy a reality. There are many promising sectors SEEDS could explore, including financial instruments 
which support coastal and marine conservation, sustainable aquaculture, marine biotechnology, blue carbon, or clean offshore energy. These can attract private investments, encourage local sourcing, or produce goods higher up the value chain. It is possible to support the seeds to transition to more sustainable ocean economy sectors by setting new standards for ocean protection and investing in the restoration of marine ecosystems such as coral reefs, mangroves, and beaches, which in turn the tourism industry relies on. Innovative financial instruments like blue bonds, debt for nature swaps, CSR investment, and blended financing, which combines development funds with philanthropic funds, are needed to finance this transition. For example, the Seychelles issued the world's first sovereign blue bonds in 2018 and provides grants to projects which advance a sustainable blue economy. But fisheries and aquaculture have a huge potential, but deep changes are needed for these industries to become sustainable. Collaboration between government, communities, business and finance is crucial to developing high standards of transparency and traceability. The momentum is growing for companies to shift to become sustainable enterprises. This means addressing the entire value chain. For the fisheries industry, there cannot be sustainability unless there is traceability, which guarantees not only conservation outcomes, but also ensure human rights are respected. Hong Tad's Blue Biotrade Initiative promotes trade and investment in marine resources in line with social, economic, and environmental criteria, and helps develop, developing countries keep a greater share of benefits. A pilot project is to come in the Caribbean, which aims to empower small-scale producers and develop sustainable gender-inclusive businesses. So developing a vibrant blue economy is feasible. Collaboration is the secret to success. Regional solutions exist, and when linked to global cooperation, it is a clear win-win for the ocean, the economy, gender equality, and social inclusion. But to move from commitment to action, governments and the private sector near clear incentives to take sustainability seriously. Heads of states and CEOs need to provide much needed responsible leadership. That's how we can catalyze change and have everyone contribute to advancing the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Donga. Very interesting perspectives. And I think we're all seeing the same trends. Uh, private companies are looking to understand how they can invest more in sustainability and more sustainable operations. And this is picking up in the credit markets. So we will now talk to two industry representatives to get a perspective on what role can business play in ensuring a healthy and productive ocean. Is there a profit here doing good things? So I would like to start off with you, Marisa Drew, Chief Sustainability Officer and Global Head of Sustainability Strategy uh, at Credit Suisse. Uh, what is your perspective on the ocean and the future of uh, potential profits on sustainability? Yes, thank you, Eric, and, and very delighted to be here today. So I represent, in some respects, the world of finance and the investment community. And when I look back over my 30 years of participating in the capital markets, um, what the finance industry needs to scale, so to mobilize big pools of capital for investment purposes, number one, you need to make the return on investment case. And Peter pointed out the report that is very much doing that. Donna touched on the enormous opportunity in sectors like sustainable fisheries and so on. The demand side is very clearly there. We know consumers want to buy ocean recycled products. They're the, some of the fastest selling categories in the fashion industry. We know the demand is there for clean energy. We know the demand, the necessity is there for us to think about alternative sources of protein, clearly in the seafood market, whether it's the alternative seafood market that is fast developing through the advent of technology or whether it's sustainable fisheries and so on. So the demand side is there. We're also having client, the climate science prove to us with science-based targets that the investment community can have faith in what they're investing in because that's another tenant of a scalable markets is that you have science-based, good academia, good research to underpin 
that investment thesis and that every day is getting better and better. We know things like investing in natural capital solutions can yield higher returns than perhaps traditional sources. Think about coastal protection and the old way of, of creating barriers um, that were made out of cement, very unfriendly. On the other hand, if you invest in mangroves, the return on that investment is not only a better solution because it actually provides better protection, but it also enhances the ecosystem of the ocean through its critical, critical part in biodiversity. So those science-based, really clear targets, another tenant. A further tenant that the investment community wants to see, again, and particularly if we're going to scale, is a common set of principles that they can rely on, a common language. If we look to the green bond market, which today is a trillion dollar volume market, why did that market scale in part? It is because there is an industry adopted set of principles that allow the investment community to speak the same language and to filter transactions so that they could understand when we talk about what is green, that we all are talking the same language. And that's what's very exciting about the new research and the new work that's being done to create a set of blue bond principles. This whole market of creating big liquid opportunities for investors to get involved with the good backing of those tenants that I described is something that uh, we get very excited about. A transparency, Donna mentioned, again, investors want to be very clear. So with data and technology on terms of transparency of where uh, your, your value chain is from start to finish, transparency on the reporting of what you're investing in. Again, these are all these foundations that are allowing the market to scale. And last but not least is innovation and financial structures. So when we poll the investment community, these are people who look after billions and billions of pools of capital. The one single thing that they pointed to in terms of a prohibition or a hurdle to invest in the blue economy was the lack of investment alternatives that spoke to what they need as the investment community. But this too is changing. We're very proud as Credit Suisse to be participating in that very actively. I will give you maybe two examples just to make it very real for, for our audience. Um, just a week or so ago, we launched a new fund called the Ocean Engagement Fund in partnership, and I wanna emphasize SDG 17 partnerships with Rockefeller Asset Management, who has a very, very long and deep history in engagement and generating outsized financial returns by engaging with companies and helping them to become better environmental stewards. And in addition to that, we're partnering with the Ocean Fund, well over a decade of good, good philanthropic and charitable work in the oceans to help inform us as an advisor. But together in partnership, we've launched this fund and the operative word is engagement, where we are going to be using our power as shareholders in the investments that we make in public companies to help identify those areas where companies can become better ocean stewards. So this is a business forum, and those of you who are business leaders, I would uh, hopefully encourage you to engage with us because I think so many businesses maybe unwittingly uh, might be um, not helping the ocean through their various activities, but I know that you want to do better. And I think many times you don't necessarily know how. Well, by engaging with the investment community backed by good science and, and, and good academics, hopefully we together can find what those key points are that can both allow you to become better ocean stewards, but also help you generate returns. Because I think if you can demonstrate as a company that you're taking this very seriously and that you're taking action, you are gonna capture the hearts and minds of the investment community. You are going to capture market share from your competitors and you're gonna generate real value. And I think that's what this is all about and circling all the way back to my return on investment point. One other example maybe of financial innovation or innovation in particular, just yesterday, we were very pleased as Credit Suisse to partner with the Monaco Yacht Club to launch the first of its kind index where yacht owners, yacht producers, so those who build boats, uh, yacht brokerages can look to identify in a friendly and simple way the carbon footprint of those um, boats and yachts um, that they are involved in. And today we don't have an ability very easily to measure the carbon footprint of large yachts. But again, we know owners, operators, and the community wants to do better. So if we can create an index which effectively shows you a curve of the jury of your peers to find out who are above and below the line on carbon emissions, what we hope we can do is drive the industry to build better, operate better, 
buy better. And that in turn will cycle all the way back just as it has done with green bonds in the green market to generate a lower cost of capital for those who want to borrow against more greener solutions. So therefore, in partnership, driving real industry change, but also driving an amazing investment thesis. So delighted to engage with any or all of you on these various topics, but I think the foundational underpinnings are there for scalable markets. And that's what this is all about. How do we drive investment to uh, generate really good returns to help uh, the equation on SDG 14? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marisa. I think uh, you summed it up very up, uh, well up. Uh, the risk is for companies in the future to not side of history. It will be costly if they're not uh, paying print on the ocean or not part of the ocean solutions if there are ocean-related industries. I think both the fund you're talking about, but also having now a blue bond framework, will be key uh, as navigating tools for these. It's like you said, Marisa, how can they be ocean stewards? And we have to use reference to really put that roadmap out in detail for the private sector. So, moving on to the next speaker, uh, Ms. Gloria Fluxa Tineman, Vice Chair and Chief Sustainability Officer at Iberosa Hotels and Resorts. You have a very strong strategy on your ocean footprint. How is that playing out in the middle of a very difficult time? Hotels and resorts. Gloria. Yes, Eric, thank you. Um, and it is a, a pleasure to be here despite the circumstances. The circumstances where our sector, the tourism sector, is trying to keep afloat. But we internally use the sailing analogy that with rough waters is where you see the good sailors. And I think the strategy plays out if you do have a long-term vision. Um, this was part of our DNA. We're a family business run by the third and fourth generation. So when you think about the oceans and you think about sustainability, you have a, have a long-term vision. And you have to be innovative and creative and stick true as well to your convictions because your convictions allow you to have a better argument. Um, for example, we are implementing still our five long-term goals in 2030, but despite the times now, it is more difficult to argument. But if your conviction is there, there's a clear point towards it. Um, secondly, if you do um, we shift your status quo, you also realize how much efficiency you can bring to the table, how much efficiency you can bring to the table when you're reevaluating um, what you're shifting and why you're shifting it. Um, and along the journey, what we've realized as well is that it is very important to have a science base in what you do. There needs to be an open collaboration from the businesses and the scientific and academic community because then you find the right path. Many times you do have the willingness, but you don't know how, how to, do, to do so, right? In our case, we have an internal team of scientists and specialists that guide us the best way we can. And sustainability is brought on the table on many decisions um, and all the strategical points. For example, throughout these COVID measures, we un undertook 300 safety measures in order to reactivate our activity and bring our clients back. Operation satisfaction, the medical advisory board told us to give you a narrow example, how to disinfect the rooms and which chemicals to use. But it was the sustainability voice on the table saying, maybe these kind of products or procedures have a less harmful impact on the environment. So again, uh, being science-based and also it is a very internal uh, tool of mobilization to keep track of data because then you can really see if you're taking the right steps, if you're following with the right steps. Um, and I think that that, that is crucial. Um, one of our goals, for example, that we just announced this year, and despite the pandemic, we're not stopping to do so, is to become carbon neutral in Iberostar by 2030. So we're definitely measuring, we're definitely putting the data, we're being scientific about it, and we'll be able to publish our roadmap by the end of this year and share it. Because at the end, it's not a question of an individual effort, it's a collective effort. So the more people that we join, the better. And I really like the words as well of public and private ownership, because there's so much you can do as an individual business, but you need the support of everyone. Uh, I like the point of Marisa saying, reach out to investors, reach out to the academic community, because all the answers are out there as well to help you find the right track. Um, so again, to finalize, I think it's a question of having a long-term vision, sticking true to your convictions, and having a science approach on how you do things when the pandemic and times become challenging. Thank you. I actually will ask you a follow-up question on that. Is this 
creating new engagement with your clients and your uh, employees? Uh, for sure, because um, one of the reasons we do this as well is, is to generate the awareness um, to generate the awareness internally, because it's not a question of imposition, it's a question of training your staff, making them understand the beautiful part of the oceans, why you're doing this, the relevance of sustainable ocean economy. And on the hand of the clients, what their clients are perceiving, it is, it's, it's an enriching uh, customer experience that they're taking home as well. Whether it be with their families, without their activities, where they're learning about circular economy in our hotels, learning about our waste-free programs, or learning about uh, ocean diversity, it is that part of the customer experience uh, that the clients do like the take back. And at the end, it's a give back to the organization because it certainly does differentiate you as a brand, and it differentiates you for the right reasons that are the, the, the reasons that you feel true with and, and feel proper. Excellent, thank you. I think these kinds of witnesses or examples from the industry is very important for us to bring along to, to Portugal for the UN Ocean Conference. It's important for everybody to get together. And what we see is now very clear expectations from clients, from owners, from banks, from owners of companies to really deliver on the SDGs, to deliver on number 14 and to be a part of the conference. And we can do this by these very concrete actions already been taken. Example here today by Credit Suisse and Iberostar. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we don't have an exact date for the Ocean Conference next year. But I think questions in the chat here. Um, what about uh, the small, uh, small scale fishermen? How can they really take part in these discussions and uh, these main uh, UN conferences. And I think actually that's one of the upsides of the pandemic and all of us entering the hyper digital age is that we can actually address more people, we can include more people. We still have a long way to go to really be inclusive of all parts of the ocean valley chain. But I think this is a good start and it should be core at our planning that we make sure that we have a UN Ocean Conference next year with thousands of participants, maybe not physically together but coming together on all kinds of platforms. It will enable, you know, thought leadership from everybody. So I'm looking forward to discuss that with all of you down the road. Uh, for our closing remarks, we have the two host nations, Portugal and Kenya. So maybe I will start with you, Ambassador Francisco Duarte Lopez, permanent representative of Portugal to the United Nations. Thank you very much, Eric. And Starla, uh, it's nice to see um, all these friends and colleagues um, on the other side of the screen. Um, and let me uh, first start by commending the UN Global Compact for organizing this uh, vibrant SDG business forum all, all along these three days, despite these um, challenging circumstances. And also to thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to intervene today. Um, and um, when looking at the theme of this session uh, towards an action-oriented UN Ocean Conference, um, we immediately see that this is fully aligned with the way that uh, Portugal, Kenya, and uh, Special Envoy Peter Thompson, and actually the whole UN membership, conceived the conference. Um, as Peter Thompson already told us, uh, the conference and, and its outcomes, I have to say, because the focus on of the UN Ocean Conference is on science and innovation, as well as on concrete transformative solutions that embody a new kind of relationship between humankind and the ocean. And it's, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to have listened today um, some of the um, concrete um, actions that um, uh, enterprises um, are already undertaking. We are committed to taking this unique opportunity to promote and approach where the ocean is seen as a source of prosperity and well-being. The ocean and its resources are put at the forefront of a new economic model, where conservation and sustainable use, resilience on one side and productivity on the other side go hand in hand. The emergence of such a new way of understanding the ocean hinges on the coming together of all relevant stakeholders. And they're a common framework. 
The UN Ocean Conference is precisely meant to support this effort as the only universal and fully inclusive global event on oceans. The UN Ocean Conference is a platform that offers a common framework within which different stakeholders can come together and work together with a common goal in the context of a strong, diverse and effective partnership, making the best out of their different strengths and abilities. And I cannot emphasize enough the role that the private sector plays in the evolution, or, uh, in the evolution we, are, we are seeking. The private sector is the main driver of innovation and the engine, the engine that produces creative solutions. The private sector is able to unlock investment and key resources supporting change. And we just uh, listened to a clear example of that. And can provide leadership and set standards that ignite the transformation we need. I would therefore like to stress the importance we attach to having ocean-related businesses, investors, and innovators participating in this global conversation and in the conference, as well as partnering with governments and other relevant stakeholders with a view to finding the solutions we are seeking and that we need. This prominent role of the private sector has led us, as you know, to plan organizing the Sustainable Blue Economy Investment Forum in Cascais, near Lisbon, back to back with the UN Ocean Conference, as well and at the same time as to guarantee that representatives of the private sector would be able to participate in the, in the official segments of the conference also. Rest assured that we remain committed to making sure these plans will go ahead on both trails. While the global pandemic and public health concerns have made it in inevitable to postpone the conference, Portugal and Kenya are still as committed to co-host the conference and we are very much we and we very much hope that this can take place already in 2021 and we are we are working on that and because this commitment remains the same so does our goal to make this conference a platform for change and so does our need to prepare as best as possible in order to be able to deliver when we get to lisbon we therefore look forward to continuing to work with you and to partner with you the un global compact compact, of course, and the private sector in general, in the context of the preparations of the UN Ocean Conference and also beyond. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you so much, uh, Francisco. And, uh, you know, you have no support, but the full support of the private sector community. This is, will be a major moment when we come together and really start showing that action is taken, but we need to take more bold actions going forward. Uh, unfortunately, our friend uh, Mr. Roderick Kondu, the Deputy Director of Fisheries and Blue Economy of Kenya, has not appeared online. Uh, so unfortunately, we won't have his remarks today. Hopefully, we'll hear from him next time we meet. It's important for us that we are all gathered at uh, these occasions. So uh, with that said, I think the uh, uh, good intervention from Francisco uh, really summed up uh, the plans and the hopes for a strong UN Ocean Conference taking, taking place as soon as possible. Thank you everybody for taking part in this session on the SDG Business Forum. Uh, it's part of the UN General Assembly week. There are many more meetings taking place this week. It's a busy week. And then I'm sure there are other meetings coming up already next week, key to the ocean agenda that we will meet again. So thank you very much for taking part. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, have a safe day. Take care. Bye-bye.